Ah, now this is a, I don't know if you know about this stuff here. Are you aware of the, the British author, uh, authors, uh, the, the Bronte sisters? They wrote Wuthering Heights, mm -hmm. Jane Eyre, romance novels yeah. in the early Victorian era, right? Now, this is, this is the Pavlovian conditioning. This is the bell being rang to make you want these things, right? Now, as part of looking into this thing, now, the, 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 these, these women, the Brontes, these three sisters, they are, they're held up almost like gods, particularly in England, in, the, in terms of how relationships should be. Their stories are about the perfect love, romantic love that's mad. For instance, Wuthering Heights, which is uh, the most famous of the stories, right? It takes place, this is, it, it's about uh, a guy who dies, Heathcliff, right? And he's dead and he's a ghost. No, sorry, Kathy, his girlfriend is dead and she's a ghost. And he's in love with her ghost. So, and he goes out to the moors where she haunts the mountains around Yorkshire, right? And that's considered the perfect love because even after, in, in, in real life, he is abusive to her. But when she dies, he realizes that that's his perfect love. And so he's, he's still, he's in love with the ghost, but he wasn't in love with the real girl. And so the story is supposed to be wonderful because, oh, it's so beautiful. Even when she was dead, he, was, he felt madly in love with her. I mean, that's about as unhealthy as you can get. But this became the benchmark and that what was considered romantic love. Again, so very similar to Romeo and Juliet, that the best love is, is tragic love. It always has to be painful and traumatic. It doesn't have to be. Now, I went to investigate this place, these people. And I've said, I remember like, I don't like you. I don't like the Bronte sisters, what you're promoting here. I don't think it's very healthy. So you investigate them, right? They were three women who were never married. They never had a, a relationship with a man, their, yet they're considered as the women who are the benchmark for knowing what love is. And yet oh, but none of these three women ever had, in real life, a proper relationship. And yet they're considered, in the English-speaking world, the engineers, the ones who wrote the blueprint on, the, on how to do it. Isn't that like the Pope being a marriage counselor? Yep. <laughs> or going to a Catholic priest. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> for, yeah for, se for sexual education, yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. For se marriage, well, yeah, same thing. Well, what does that tell you? They don't want us having knowing the real thing. They want us dysfunctional because we're dependent on... Uh, but anyway, I went to... I was taken... My friend took me to where the, the village in Yorkshire where this all happened. Howarth is the name of the village, right? Now, this, these stories were written in the early 1800s, okay? 1830s, around that time. The place is horrible. Now, it's a, very, it's a very picturesque English, ancient English traditional village. It's, the buildings are all intact. It looks like a movie set, you know, like it looks like from an ancient movie set, but it has this dark energy about it. It's, 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 the place is very gothic and very dark and very negative, even though it's, it's architecturally beautiful. It's in a very bleak valley. It's surrounded by incredibly bleak moorlands. The moors in England are these low-lying mountains that are just basically dead, just grass growing on them, brown grass growing on them. Very bleak, very windswept, very unromantic. And yet you could see in, in, in this area was three women who developed as part of a kind of a weird fantasy life. They were the daughters of a Presbyterian minister. So their, their limitations for romance were already narrow to begin with in Victorian times. So they concocted within their worlds an almost a neurosis, a mental illness of what romance was supposed to be. And guess what? It became the norm. It's, you know, and the peep, that's what they pushed off. The movies were made about it. The songs about Wuthering Heights, about Cathy singing on the moors to Heathcliff, come back to me, take me home, and all this stuff that love is miserable, it's dangerous, and it transcends death, but not in a health, in a healthy way. It, trans, it transcends death in a very dark and negative way. And this became what romance was seen like, particularly in, the, in British society. It has to be dark, has to be pale, painful, has to be miserable. It has to be soul-destroying. 
it, and, and the more miserable it is, the more beautiful it is. And that's another weird aspect about it as well. That was to tell you that even if your, your, your relationships didn't work, you were still better than being alone. That's really what it comes down to. That's what, really what these stories are telling you. That being an independent person on your own is even worse than being in love with a corpse. That's really what Wuthering Heights is selling you. You must be dependent on, you cannot, and the, the thing is, it creates unrealistic expectations as well. Because again, this spinned off into the date movies, the romance movies, the love stories, where on the screen everyone has a wonderful time, and they all, they, it's, it all works out great in the end. All the couples are beautiful, the man is handsome, the woman is gorgeous. And the same with the love songs. And these become pollutants. They become almost like they pollute your consciousness. They pollute your soul because they put unrealistic expectations of what love is in, into you. And they happen when you're a teenager, most of all. They happen when they're very vulnerable part in your life. And you go around thinking about, this is what I want. I want the perfect woman. I want the perfect man. I want this. And it's all engineered because if you look at the history of what we call romance before this era, it didn't really exist. It didn't, people just got married out of necessity. So for instance, if you were in say an agrarian society, and it still goes on in places like India and places like that, in rural India, if you were a guy who was 18 or 19, and there was a girl in the village who was 18 or 19, the matchmaker would get you married. Why? To start the child, keep the children going, keep the fat village going, keep the culture going and had nothing to do with romance. It was just basically like a breeding program. You were like a farm animal. And you had like the matchmaker in the village who was buying, I don't know if you had it in Norway, but you had it in Ireland, and you had it in very many other cultures, where the old agrarian systems, you would have the woman, she was always, nearly always an elderly woman for some reason, I don't know why. I guess maybe she's had uh, experience in life. But that's also goes, probably goes back to the idea of the crone. I don't even know what the expression crone means. The, the wise woman, the wise older woman who lives in the village, who knows, has, has the answer to everything. Very common in agrarian cultures and even older cultures. That's something we've lost in recent centuries. The idea of the wise elderly woman who's very, very wise and she knows how to solve problems for people. But she would be the matchmaker and she would say, well, you know, you're Michael, he's 17. And they have Jane over there, and she's she's sixteen. They make a perfect match, you know, that kind of thing. And they would marry them out of necessity, because he's got fourteen acres. His dad, he's gonna go have fourteen acres of land coming to him. Mary doesn't have any, or whatever her name is, Jane. So this guarantees her economic survival after her parents die, because she can marry Michael, and he'll still have a farm, and he'll take care of her, and they can have children. And the sentence cycle continues. Romance had nothing to do with it. And, it. and romance had so little to do with it that it, if it did take part, if it did happen, it would often have terrible repercussions. Don't you still see what happens in the Islamic world when you have like some woman, girl runs away? And some countries, uh, uh, you know, from her, her for it were a boyfriend, especially if she's from like a well-to-do family, they'll, they'll cut her head off. It still goes on. These things still happen. And that comes out of the idea that you will, <coughs> you will not marry who you love, you will marry who you need. And we'll tell you who it is. These arranged marriage things can go to extremes. And that was the world up until 200 years ago. Believe it or not, in your country, everywhere, romance didn't really exist. A guy didn't see a girl go up and down the street one day and say to her, oh, she's nice, I like her, I'd like to marry her, and then he tries to woo her. That's only a recent thing. But there's an interesting aspect to that as well that goes to like, I'm going to talk about it in a second. Where did that come from and why? Because human beings evolve on lots of different levels. And one of them could be, okay, at those times there wasn't a need for it, but anyone who breaks from the norm is usually attacked and ridiculed or even killed by the prevailing society because they broke from the norm because the society does not tolerate the culture does not tolerate particularly a strict culture anyone who breaks away from it so love would have been seen in a society like that as something that was very very dangerous we can't have all our young people falling in love here or anyone they want it may damage 
the structure of, and integrity of the society. So we have to make it so they're afraid to run away. They're afraid to fall in love with someone else. Human beings being amazing creatures that they are, you know, that's why you'd have stories like so many, even earlier romance stories were based on the idea that the guy ran away with the girl and the, 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 the men in the town came after him with horses. Do not, you, cannot, you're, you cannot fall in love, that kind of thing. But that was really what happened. It was actually worse than that. They would just kill him in many cases. I mean, usually the girl. But uh, evil. But human beings. You see, one of the things that we know, one of the things for me in my work in recent years was learning about epigenetics. That was a big thing for me when I, when the, I discovered about this because suddenly my life made a lot of sense and it gave me a lot of hope in this world. Epigen what epigenetics is, Siv, could you get me a glass of water? Please, thank you. What epigenetics is, is what they discovered, it, it's it been kind of known about for a while, but they had never really been able to scientifically validate it until, say, the last 10 years. It was always assumed since the discovery of the, the genome, the genotype, your, your genetic, your DNA sequence, that what your genes were was what you always were. So if you got these genes from your parents, these, this DNA, that was it. That was the blueprint, that was the model, that was the, you were determined by that, okay? Uh, but they found out in recent times, it's not. And you can switch on gene, gene sequences that were inactive, and that's called epigenetics. And they're switched on by, they say, if you, if you, look, at the, if you look at the documents, like the, uh, the medical documents or the scientific documents behind epigenetics, they'll say on factors other than hereditary factors, meaning things other than, you know, you were born that way. Something switches the genes on. Something switches the genetics on. They never say what it really is. It's your thoughts. Your thoughts can switch on inactive, thank you, Sam, inactive gene sequences that were switched off before. Thank you, I needed that. Now, how is this relevant to this idea? Human beings are evolving all the time. Human beings not only evolve physically, but they evolve in other ways. Now, how they found out about epigenetics was a phenomenal story. There was two children in Chicago's, in Chicago Children's Hospital about five years ago who had this disease that was always assumed to be genetic, meaning that the parents had it, one of the parents had it, both of the children had it. I can't remember the name, it was a very complicated name, but that was the nature of this, this particular, rare, very rare disease. And in every case, it had been shown to be genetic. Well, what happened was, one, of the, one woman had a child, and while she, while she was being treated, and the doctor was going, we had this disease, the mother had it, and the child had it, right? And they asked the mother, you know, because we're researching this disease, and she says, anything we should know about it, and she says, I have a terrible thing, she's not the only child, I had a twin, she has a twin sister, okay, she has a twin sister, and her twin sister had been given up, she could only take care of one child, she, was, she didn't have the money to take care of two children, so she gave one of her daughters away, never told the husband that she married later, so anyway, she gave one of the children up, they wanted to locate this child to find out so they could tell the child, you have this disease and you will need this certain treatment. Well, what that the most amazing thing happened when they found this child. The child didn't have the disease, the first case in history. The first case in history. They tested the kid's genes and it was the gene sequences were switched off. And what they determined was the reason why this kid didn't have this disease is because it didn't know it had it. It had switched, the gene sequence was not switched on. Now the mother had not told the child and the child had been detected for the disease of the other child earlier on. And they reckon it was because of the collective unconsciousness. They somehow, the gene, there's a thing called the, the theory of interactive alignment where brain <coughs> patterns actually sync and thoughts sync between close families and quote, people who are close together in friendships. But this child had not switched on the gene sequence and they finally had reluctantly had hard proof that your genes can actually be switched on and off according to the thoughts in your head. According to the thoughts in your head. 
And this is now, now they're trying everything to say, oh, you know, it's not that simple. It is that simple. They proved it. <coughs> proved it. Uh, conclusively, the child did not have the disease because it didn't know it had it. Mm. No one had told it. No one had made it feel it that way. So this was like a revelation epigenetics. This changes everything. And this is also, going, I'm going to talk about this more in depth tomorrow night because this is why you create, what, you think, <coughs> what goes on up here, right? Is, is much more important than how it affects you socially. It can actually affect your physical health. It can actually affect even how you look and how you change. And that's probably what's happening with those people who meet someone who they didn't think was that attractive at first, came to know them and thought they were beautiful. There was an ep some kind of epigenetic thing that switched up. And if we have exterior ideas of love being imposed upon us, it will affect how we view the world. So for instance, we may be looking, suppose you, we, we may be looking for the wrong people, we're doing it according to what well, we're saying, oh, it's, he's right for me, she's right for me. And that came out of the agra agrarian thing where women had no economic power, men had economic power, and they had to find a way so the daughters wouldn't starve. So they could be taken care of. That's why there were such a spinsters, you know, like unmarried women had such a bad name years ago because no one was taken care of her. Nowadays it's not so bad. But years ago, especially in a rural area, you used to feel sorry for her if she wasn't married. Because it was an economic thing, she could die. You know, don't take care of her. And so that's where that came from. So if if you can think, and this way, you know, people if people are looking for ideas of a perfect relationship. They won't get it because they're kind of like wishing against it in some ways. It's like you're wishing against it. But if you have an idea of your head of what you want, you can actually make yourself, through epigenetics, have a different approach to life. And so instead of you going through heartbreak or looking for relationships that are perfect, and then going through the misery of a broken heart afterwards and all this stuff, a lot, of you, a lot of that comes from the, a program that's been given to us through mass media for a very long time now, early 1800s, that, that love sucks, that love, is, love, love can be crap, that love is ultimately doomed, and love is dangerous, and love is hurtful, <coughs> and love is broken hearts, and that's all part of the process. It doesn't have to be. You can change how you feel about love. Now... There's a thing called, and this is true, I didn't, but when I first read about this, I was researching for this in my first book, Puzzling People, and I didn't believe this when I first heard about it, but it's actually something called broken heart syndrome, where your heart can actually be destroyed by heartbreak, like fall, you know, like a broken heart, like somebody broke my heart, she, she left me and she doesn't love me now. It happens, it's happened with women, like they're hooked, they were married to men for long times, and the heart, what actually happens, the broken heart, the valve, when you, we've all been in love, I'm sure, right? And we've all, the love brought, stopped. Right? And the, the relationship ended. You remember that pounding in your chest? Oh, he, she doesn't love me anymore. I'm so heartbroken. She doesn't, he does, she doesn't love me anymore. I'm so, that pain you get, that, you know, that, that hurt, that deep down hurt, that you really want that person back because you really cared for them and you really loved them. And you're going, oh, oh, oh. It's really, well, in extreme cases, extreme cases that can actually rupture the valve in the heart and actually cause a heart attack and the person dies. And that's it's literally called broken heart syndrome. It's called stress cardiomyopathy. That's the term they use for it. And the Japanese uh, doctors did very good, very good research on this. It's literally like the heart explodes in pain and grief. And this is one of the things that like, that I, I discovered through the people in relationship with psychopaths, they would have a, heart, a heartbreak, pain, emotional pain, that was so deep after these relationships ended that they couldn't feel they could live ever again because they, the pathological or the, dangerous, the toxic individual had made them so dependent upon them and made them believe that they couldn't exist without them that when they pulled it away, they felt that they had no idea even who they were anymore that they, had, they couldn't understand the idea of being alone. Very dangerous. <coughs> I mean, this is, this is the health ramifications of getting too romantically attached to someone. You know, okay, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, 
But when it goes wrong, the repercussions can be horrific, including death through these things like cardio stress, cardiomyopathy. This is why you always have to, like I said, the limbic region in the brain, you always have to regulate your emotions. Be an adult. Now, you guys in Norway are better at it, but in us, I can just, I can tell that like your culture is different that way. You're much more grown up. English speaking cultures are much more, especially in the United States, very childlike, very, very impulsive. Eh, this kind of thing. I gotta have it now. Eh. The perfect house, the perfect man, the biggest car. Childlike, childish. Well, guess what? They're gonna have the biggest, that's why half of them are on medical treatments. They're all going to psychiatrists, they're all, so many of them are on the SSRIs and the, all these kinds of other drugs. For that simple reason, is because they've been encouraged to live like in this childlike brain. Where they're in love, they need love, they need affection, they need all this constantly and they expect it all their lives. But human life isn't like that. And what happens is the crash. And the crash is what happens because they're constantly trying to get a fix of chemicals that they got when they may have had one perfect romance when they were like 20 or 19 or 22 or 23 and they, uh, what happened, they were, and what they got was a flood of chemicals and that was the perfect love affair and they, they spend the rest of their lives trying to get that from everything from everything and what happens is they end up on the psychiatrist's couch or they end up having to take SSRI mood and mood, mood stabilizing drugs to try and keep them at a certain level and that's, you know, that's the big problem in the English speaking societies, particularly ones that have a very dominant American. When I say American, I don't mean to put down American people. I'm talking about Hollywood, advertising, Coca-Cola, all that kind of thing. You know, the, Amer the American commercial aspect. Now, Chemical addiction plays a huge, a huge part in these sort of like infatuation things. There's two particular chemicals in the brain, dopamine and oxytocin. You know that expression to be made of dope? Like, oh, he's a dope. It's an American expression. Don't be dopey. That's what that comes from. Mm -hmm. You're being completely run by dopamine. And that's, that, that's the origin of that phrase. You're, being, you're run by dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter in the brain. It happens when you fall in love, when someone tells you, gives you a compliment. It happens when you get your eating chocolate. It happens, it releases this, this chemical in the brain that makes you feel very at pleasure. Don't have a care in the world. You go, ah, you're floating around, everything's happy. Blah, 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 blah. But it's only a temporary thing your brain does. It's not supposed to be there all the time. And that's dopamine. And people try to get rushes of dopamine all the time in their lives. And that's why when you have that, like, in the early days of a relationship where every, the two couple are so in love, oh, they're so in love, and then after a few years, they're like, what happened? What happened? How, how, how come we used to have this wonderful romance and we don't know? Well, that's, that's, that's nothing wrong. They, they think there's something wrong with that. It's not. The dopamine has all been used up. That's all. Dope. Because the dopamine was there to actually get them to bond in the first place. Job done, why do you need any more dopamine? And this is why in English, because I don't know it's here, but there's so much high, very high divorce rates now because everyone wants that dopamine rush over and over and over again. They want, they, they want, to, be, they want to be teenagers over and over again. And that's the dopamine. They want that feeling of falling in love and beginning out on a new project. Another one is oxytocin. Very interesting one, that one. Oxytocin is a another neurotransmitter chemical in the brain that causes bonding between people. It's called empathy. Now, empathy is a word that does, has a, 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 a great misunderstanding to it. People think empathy is this, have, this means, you know, looking after other people. It doesn't really mean that. That's compassion. That's a different thing. Empathy is what, what empathy is, is that an understanding that we're working together. So for instance, and how that's done is because of flooding of oxytocin in the brain. So for instance, a soccer team that's playing to a certain strategy, right, a game plan, they actually have high levels of oxytocin while this is going on because they're bonding. And that's helps on, on, a, on a, like an amazing soccer team, right? 
say, like the Brazil team that won the 1977 World Cup, or 70 World Cup. I've watched all videos of that. And players could, could pass, could know where the other player was behind them without even looking at them because their oxytocin levels were so high and they were so finely in tune with each other's instincts that like, they could kick the ball sideways knowing that the, the, the striker was coming forward from his team. Brilliant. It's an amazing thing when you watch it. And people would think it was like telepathic almost mm -hmm. to play like that. And that's the oxytocin. Soldiers in battle are flooded with oxytocin in the same air. That's why they, can't, they, they make the march and file during basic training. This is why troops are made to go through specific challenges together. That bonding is actually caused by oxytocin. It's actually caused by it. <coughs> Go and take a break now. And I'll, I'll just finish up with the oxytocin thing. Now, <coughs> in a personal relationship, women are very prone to oxytocin. It's just your neurology. Not your fault or anything wrong. But that's what happens. And the oxytocin is, in women is brought about by the sense of particularly sex. So that's why... This is why women associate sex with love more than men, in general, for that reason. Because women have high floods of oxytocin in their brains with sex, where men do not have it to the same level. This is why women often think they could fall in love with a guy they have sex with, but a man doesn't necessarily fall in love with her. It's not because of something <coughs> wrong with him, or he doesn't care about her. He's not getting the same level of oxytocin in the brain that she is. Because the evolution is making it happen because he wants her. She, no, the evolution <coughs> wants her to have a baby. So that's why women are often perplexed that they're, they're in love with a fellow they're having sex with, right? And they can't understand why he's just happy. He's just a friend. And she doesn't get it. That's because her oxytocin level <coughs> has made her bond with him. But his oxytocin level is much less than he hasn't bonded with her. That's all that means. That's why men have less levels of oxytocin. Oxytocin is also released when women breastfeed. It's to create a <coughs> bond with the baby, to take care of them. And that's another, that's another problem. You know, the other thing, oh, men and women, they never agree on anything. There's a lot of truth to that because neurochemicals. We fail to understand we're, we're physically different inside as well, neurology. We're going to take a break now? Yeah, we're going to take a break now. Thank you very much. We're not, we're not finished, right? Uh, we're not finished. Okay. okay. <laughs> we are finished. For you, you're not finished. You're not finished. Well, anyway, no, can, can I just quickly wrap this up, okay? Yeah. I'm, you see, I, I'm a big melt. Well, if you fall, if you want to understand what love is, right? And this is the bottom line. The couples who stay together the longest and been the most happiest are the ones who've also gone through the biggest problems and got over them because they learned to work together understanding each other's needs and that's the secret that's the secret if you can if you can love a person even because of when things are bad and they love you then that's the real, that's the, that's the real, that is the real love, not what's in the romance movie. And that's why the couples who last the longest are the ones who went through the most problems and they're still together. Okay, thanks very much.